These are thoracic radiology board view cases, and the topic of this group is classic signs. Good luck. Please name this sign. So on this image, we have linear lucencies that are branching, um, situated within a region of opacified lung. Um, the sign we're looking for is an air bronchogram. What's always true when air bronchograms are observed? While air bronchograms can sometimes be seen in the setting of atelectasis, sometimes in the setting of pneumonia, and sometimes in the setting of malignancy, what's always true is that the central airway is patent so that air can actually enter the lung and produce the air bronchogram. Name this sign. So in the lower left chest on this image, we see two relatively sharp linear interfaces. One corresponds to the cardiac silhouette and the other corresponds to a flat waist sign. What is your best diagnosis? So when you see a flat waist sign, um, the best diagnosis to think of is left lower lobar atelectasis. Name this sign. Here's a little help. So in this case, we see three parallel bands, um, two that are lucent and darker, and one in between these bands that's whiter and more opaque. We refer to this as an Oreo sign because it's supposed to remind us of the way an Oreo cookie looks like on its edge. Um, this is probably a little bit better illustrated on a sagittal CT image. Um, we think about pericardial effusions when we encounter um, a Oreo sign. What's the diagnosis and relationship of the finding on this image compared um, to a pericardial effusion? So in the chest, we have the Oreo sign. On shoulder MRIs, we have the double Oreo sign. The double Oreo sign corresponds to a slap tear of the shoulder. Um, the two hyperintense lines in this W Oreo sign um, uh, correspond to the superior labral tear and a physiologic um, cerebral uh, recess. Name the nodular interstitial pattern on this image. So the pattern we're looking for here is a random or a miliary pattern. Um, the features of a random or miliary nodular interstitial pattern are lots and lots of little tiny micronodules um, that are of relatively uniform size. The dots, these little micronodules, are all relatively discrete, so they're not indistinct and fuzzy like a centrilobular um, nodular interstitial pattern would look. These dots are relatively diffusely distributed, meaning that there are no regions of sparing of lung. Um, the dots don't form clicks, so there isn't um, clusters or clumps of these things. They're all just kind of separate from each other. Um, there's no radial symmetry at the lobular level, meaning the dots are not equidistant from each other, like you might see with a centrilobular pattern. And with a random or miliary um, nodular interstitial pattern, a few of these dots might touch the pleura. Now, with a random or a miliary nodular interstitial pattern, um, which of the following may manifest with this kind of pattern? So with a, a random or a... Um, um, miliary nodular interstitial pattern. Uh, we tend to think of disseminated hemat uh, hematogenously disseminated uh, infections, um, usually TB, non-tubercular mycobacterial and endemic fungal infections, and we also think about hematogenously disseminated metastases, um, thyroid cancer is um, the classic example. Non-invasive aspergillosis uh, should not manifest like this. It should usually manifest as a monod sign, a ball in a cavity. Staph and mycoplasma infections can manifest as either centrilobular or tree and bud uh, nodular interstitial patterns, which are different than a random or a miliary pattern, or consolidation. Consolidation in cases of staph um, can potentially cavitate, and you might even see additional complications that would happen in the setting of a cavitating consolidation. What groups are at higher risk of developing hematogenously disseminated infections? So when we see cases of, say, miliary tuberculosis or other miliary infections, um, we tend to think of the young and we think of immunocompromised adults. Name this imaging feature, and um, the answer is not ear bronchogram. 
So we're just uh, referring to this large region of opacified uh, white appearing lung here. Uh, the uh, volume of this area looks maintained. The, uh, the area of opacified lung does not look uh, contracted like you might see in atelectasis fibrosis. Uh, the answer we're looking for is just consolidation. Uh, consolidation represents basically just a region of increased attenuation lung volume maintained. Now, usually the attenuation characteristics of the consolidation aren't all that helpful in establishing the differential diagnosis of a consolidation. While it might help us differentiate the consolidation from, say, atelectasis, um, the cause of the consolidation um, can't usually be um, elucidated just by looking at the attenuation characteristics here. There are two exceptions, though. Name two traditional examples where the attenuation of the consolidation is helpful for diagnosis. And those two examples are lipoid pneumonia and amyotoxicity. With lipoid pneumonia, you'll uh, sometimes encounter a region of consolidation that contains macroscopic fat, which is pretty unusual. With amyoderm toxicity, uh, in these cases, uh, the ones that manifest as organized pneumonia, you'll see a region of consolidation that looks quite hyperattenuating, almost like it's avidly enhancing, even though you might be looking at a non-contrast CT. Please name this sign. And the answer we're looking for is a reversed halo or atoll sign. Now, it's pretty common to see ground glass on the margins of a region of consolidation. It's a little bit more unusual to see consolidation on the margins of a region of ground glass, hence the term reversed. When we see a reversed halo or an atoll sign, what's your differential diagnosis? So uh, with a uh, atoll sign or reverse halo sign, the classic um, differential diagnosis that we lead with is usually organized pneumonia. It's uh, relative eosinophilic pneumonia and acute pulmonary infarcts. It turns out that uh, lung infections can sometimes uh, manifest like this. Um, and um, the other thing to think about is the kind of lung changes we would see after um, an RF ablation has been performed. Please name this sign. So at the right lung base on this image, we see two curvilinear interfaces. One corresponds to the diaphragm and liver, um, and the other corresponds to something else. Um, we refer to this as a double diaphragm sign. What's your diagnosis? So when we see a double diaphragm sign, uh, we should think about a basal pneumothorax. Please name this sign. So in this image, uh, in the posterior left lung, we have a solid nodule or mass containing a thin curvilinear uniform width lucency. The answer here we're looking for is an air crescent sign. With an air crescent sign, what's your best diagnosis? With an air crescent sign where we see this thin uniform um, kind of um, cavitation within a solid nodule or a mass, um, the best diagnosis is invasive aspergillosis. Um, when we see cases of um, invasive aspergillosis manifest with this sign, it's usually actually a positive prognostic sign, indicating that the immune system of the patient is actually beginning to recover and address that lung infection. Don't confuse this with an aspergilloma. Uh, the monoid sign, the area of cavitation is not a uh, one or two millimeter rim, but a large um, space. Now, the next image is going to be of a hip. What's the name of this sign and what's its significance? We show you this image because while we were talking about air crescent signs in the lung, this is another uh, crescent sign. Um, this is a crescent sign on MSK imaging. Um, in this case, we see a lucent curve, a curvilinear lucency right below the um, cortical margin of the right of, of the uh, right femoral head. Crescent sign um, in this setting corresponds to impending collapse of the femoral head uh, due to avascular necrosis. Name this sign. So this is a classic sign we refer to as the golden S sign. Um, in these kind of cases, what you see is a central mass um, that forms the kind of the inferior part of the S, if you will. 
that central mass is often a large bronchogenic cancer, but can be a mass of other sort that's causing obstruction of the right upper lobe airways. The more superior um, aspect of that S uh, corresponds to the minor fissure. Um, you have opacified right upper lobe on one side and lucent lung on the other side. Name this sign. So this is an example of the hilum overlay sign. The hilum overlay sign is a sign that's meant to kind of help us figure out when we see a uh, mass that's um, you know in the medial kind of mid chest area, whether that mass is hilar or not. Um, the thought process is if the mass um, was hilar, you could no longer actually still make out the margins of the hilar vessels because there'd be no lung um, surrounding those uh, vessels. They'd just be soft tissue. Um, if you can see the outline of the hilar vessels, despite there being a mass, it would suggest that those hilar vessels are being surrounded by air and whatever this mass was, was either in front or behind the hilum. Uh, more often an anterior mediastinal mass than say a posterior mediastinal mass. All the following about the hilar convergence sign are true, except Now, while the hilum overlay sign was supposed to help us distinguish hilar from non-hilar masses, the hilar convergence sign is supposed to help us distinguish between just a huge pulmonary artery versus a real hilar mass. Um, the thinking is, um, if the blood vessels in the kind of the central lung look like they're converging towards the mass, um, we think it's more likely this mass is just a big pulmonary artery. Now, if these blood vessels are converging towards something other than the mass, say like the heart or something, we're thinking something uh, more ominous, a hilar mass as opposed to just an enlarged pulmonary artery. So in this case, um, answers A and B are true statements, whereas answer C is incorrect. Please name this sign. So this is an example of crazy paving, um, a combination of an interlobular septal pattern and some ground glass opacities in the lung. What's your differential diagnosis for crazy paving? Well, the differential diagnosis for crazy paving represents basically the union of the differential diagnosis for a septal, inter, um, septal um, interstitial pattern and ground glass opacities. Uh, we think of acute airspace processes like your pulmonary edemas, alveolar hemorrhage, and PJP infections, uh, which are known to, for, known to cause both ground glass opacities and an interlobular septal pattern. Um, two neoplasms can sometimes do this, BAC, or what we now refer to as, say, um, a lipidic adenocarcinoma, and lymphangitic carcinomatosis sometimes too. Um, both can manifest as interlobular septal pattern and ground glass opacities. Um, strange ranger, uh, PAP, alveolar proteinosis, is probably the more classic thing that we, we think of first. Name this lung opacity. So there is a lung opacity here, but it's an opacity of the type that still permits us to see the underlying anatomy of the lung parenchyma. We see the blood vessels still. Um, with consolidation or atelectasis or fibrosis, the opacity is so dense we can no longer see the, the vessel margins. Um, with ground glass opacities, however, we still can. Um, it's a little bit like the difference between uh, looking through a piece of paper versus looking through a tinted glass window, as a friend of mine would say. Provide a differential diagnosis when we see isolated symmetric ground glass lung opacities. So uh, the differential diagnosis for ground glass opacities in the setting of, say, consolidation or a mass or interstitial pattern is just extremely broad. But when we're talking about just ground glass by itself without um, a significant consolidation uh, present or interstitial pattern present, uh, an isolated uh, ground glass past picture, it's a little bit more uh, limited of a differential diagnosis. 
and uh, we handle the differential diagnosis according to the presentation of the patient. So a patient who has isolated ground glass opacities presenting with acute dyspnea, we tend to think of um, classic things like cardiogenic edema, maybe flash edema, uh, diffuse alveolar damage, or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage on uh, more on more rare occasions. Um, in a debilitated inpatient, the, probably the best answer is cardiogenic edema. Um, patients presenting with a history of progressive dyspnea, usually as an outpatient, um, we would think of isolated ground glass opacities being caused by either chronic interstitial lung diseases or a few strange rangers. The chronic interstitial diseases range from things like um, non-fibrotic HP to cellular subtype NSIP, um, AIP, disquamative interstitial pneumonia, and LIP. Uh, with LIP, you'd probably expect to see cysts, though, too. Strange rangers are um, things like alveolar proteinosis. That can manifest as an isolated ground glass pattern. Sometimes the interlobular septal component may not be quite so um, conspicuous. Um, L, um, BAC, or what we now refer to as, um, let's say, uh, lipidic adenocarcinoma, can sometimes present as a relatively isolated ground glass opacity. And sometimes even organizing pneumonia can present as a isolated ground glass opacity, that, though that's probably more common. Um, it's more common for organizing pneumonia, uh, organizing pneumonia to present with some element of consolidation. Um, in folks uh, who are immunocompromised, um, presenting with an isolated ground glass opacity picture, uh, we kind of think first of uh, pneumocystis infections and opportunistic viral infections, things like uh, CMV, HSV, or even RSV in the immunocompromised host. And in bone marrow suppressed patients, we think of the same infections, but we also um, think about alveolar hemorrhage volume overload, drug toxicity, uh, because these folks uh, not only are prone to these opportunistic infections, but perhaps to the, um, the uh, side effects or complications that might uh, be involved in the treatment they're receiving, um, oftentimes chemotherapy or maybe a bone marrow transplant. Um, when we talk about um, isolated ground glass opacities and drug toxicity patterns and stuff, um, just remember that um, drug toxicity can manifest as many of the different lung injury patterns that we, um, we've studied. Um, um, there are nine of these on this list here. Um, and many of these lung injury patterns can present as an isolated ground glass opacity. So when we talk about drug toxicity, uh, we're talking about a relatively um, large family of um, um, pathologic entities. Please name this sign. So on this image, uh, enhanced chest CT, we see um, fluid uh, in the pleural space um, with uh, kind of an enhancing soft tissue um, layer, um, both superficial and deep to that fluid. Uh, we refer to this as a split pleural sign. Um, so usually to see a split pleural sign, we're uh, looking at a contrast enhanced um, chest CT, though occasionally I guess you can probably see it um, on some unenhanced CTs, um, basically representing pleural fluid accumulation be uh, between layers of thickened visceral and parotid pleura, and um, usually indicative of an exudative uh, pleural process. What's your differential diagnosis? So when we see a split pleural sign, um, things we think about um, are exudative pleural processes, um, leading with things like an empyema or a malignant pleural effusion. Um, other things that can cause an exudative pleural effusion might be on our list. Um, the pleural effusion we might see in a patient who's had a PE and maybe an infarct, uh, collagen vascular disease, um, and um, um, people who've seen radiation treatment. Please identify this sign and ignore the chest port catheter. Okay, we asked you to ignore the chest port catheter because this person just has a variant kind of central venous anatomy. Um, but the imaging feature we want you to focus on is in the lower right portion of this patient's chest. Uh, what we're pointing to here is a deep sulcus sign. Um, you can see how um, it's, uh, the sulcus is normal on the left side. On the right side, it seems to dive very, very deeply and narrowly there. Now, uh, we probably are aware of a deep sulcus sign is usually indicative of a pneumothorax. What's the most common setting of a false positive deep sulcus sign? So the most common setting of a false positive deep sulcus sign is COPD, where hyperaeration of the lungs appears to deepen the lateral costophrenic angle sometimes. List at least three other signs of pneumothorax on supine chest x-rays.
So there's actually a lot more than three imaging findings. We'll try to run down many of them here. Um, with a patient who's in a supine position, especially if they're um, flat, um, say on a trauma bay, uh, pneumothoraces may not necessarily accumulate um, at the lung apices first. Um, they'll accumulate where the most non-dependent part of the chest is. And when you're lying on your back, that may not be the apex. It may often be closer to the lung basis. So um, findings of a pneumothorax on a supine chest x-ray might be um, just a unusually appearing uh, reason of lucency near the lung base. Um, the double diaphragm sign we showed you earlier. Um, sometimes you will see the inferior edge of the lower lung, which is kind of related to the, the double diaphragm sign. Um, it's not normal to see the inferior edge of the heart, um, but sometimes if it is um, pneumothorax, um, very inferiorly you might see that. Uh, likewise, uh, a visceral lateral margin of the right middle lobe may be a fine. Uh, um, some, a very, very sharp cardiomediastinal border. We expect the cardiomediastinal border to be a slightly fuzzy uh, normally, but if it's very, very sharp, um, it might be because there is a, um, a pleural interface that's outlining it for us to see. Um, same thing goes for very sharp pericardial fat. Identify this sign. So this is an example of a loof sickle or air sickle sign um, in the upper left chest. What category of disorder is most likely to cause this sign in an outpatient? So with a loof sickle sign, we're usually thinking about an obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis case, um, and the superior segment of the aerated left lower lobe kind of creeps up to the apex and forms this kind of uh, air crescent. Um, with an obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis picture, we're usually concerned about, especially in an outpatient, some sort of neoplasm essentially obstructing um, lung mass. With an inpatient, um, you might be thinking of, say, just uh, you know, a large central mucus plug. Please identify this sign. So the imaging um, sign on this um, image is uh, R, uh, tree and bud nodules. Widespread tree and bud nodules in the absence of bronchiectasis and absence of airspace passes are typical for all except. And the answer here is actually all of the above. Um, it's possible to encounter um, tree and bud nodules um, in an acute patient um, uh, on acute basis uh, with no other airspace passes in aspiration infections, uh, bacterial lung infections, mycobacterial and viral lung infections. Multifocal tree and bud nodules with associate airspace passes, but no bronchiectasis are called what term? And when we see um, tree and bud nodules with um, airspace passes, but there is no bronchiectasis, um, we often will apply the term bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia is most commonly due to which etiologies? And the uh, lung infections we're most usually um, going to encounter bronchopneumonia and are usually bacterial lung infections and aspiration um, uh, induced lung infections. Please identify this sign. So what here, what we have here are solid lung nozzles with a zone of ground glass around them. Um, these are referred to as ground glass halos. Um, you can kind of see them around at least two of these um, three right lower lobe lung nozzles. This happens to be a patient with PTLD or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. What's the cause of ground glass halos when we see them around lung nodules? Not just this case. So ground glass halos around lung nozzles can sometimes be caused by just a little bit of alveolar hemorrhage, sometimes tumor cell infiltration, and sometimes inflammatory infiltrate. Hemorrhagic lung nozzles may be observed in what settings? So 
So settings in which we may see a hemorrhagic lung nodule, or basically a solid nodule for ground glass halo, um, might be in the setting of an invasive fungal infection, like invasive aspergillosis. Um, sometimes some um, hypervascular metastases. Um, Wegner's, or what we currently call granulomatous polyangitis, um, granulomatosis with polyangitis, um, can present as nodules with um, hemorrhage around them, and um, in some cases of lung nodules that have been biopsied. Um, hypervascular um, metastases, um, uh, the things we think about might be more classically, um, say, choriocarcinoma and these other two sarcomas here too. Next case, please identify the sign on this image. And the imaging sign we're looking here um, is honeycombing. Imaging features of honeycombing include all except Pulmonary fibrosis may be absent is the incorrect statement here. Um, the other four are um, imaging features of honeycombing. Uh, with honeycombing, the cystic air spaces tend to be of relatively similar size, and they often look like they're sharing walls. And the sizes of the um, air cysts uh, in honeycombing can vary from relatively small to uh, kind of not so small. Um, Honeycombing represents end-stage um, reticular interstitial fibrosis, so it would be unusual to see end-stage um, disease, um, if you will, without seeing not-so-end-stage disease, too. So E is the incorrect statement. Honeycombing may be seen in the setting of which? And the answer here is all of the above. Um, while honeycombing can be seen in the setting of all the things on our reticular interstitial um, um, lung pattern uh, differential, so we can see honeycombing in the setting of UIP, um, fibrotic NSIP, fibrotic HP, and sarcoid, um, honeycombing has been described in the setting of disquamative interstitial pneumonia as well. So the answer here is E, all of the above. Please identify this sign. So what we have here on an enhanced chest CT is a um, branching um, hyperattenuating structure representing contrast within a blood vessel um, that's um, you know, um, flowing through a region of opacified lung. This is a CT angiogram sign. It's um, basically um, enhancement of pulmonary vessels that are patent um, through a region of uh, lung that isn't quite enhancing as much as the, um, the blood vessel is. Which of the following is false about CT angiogram sign? So the false statement here is the absolute attenuation of the surrounding consolidation is always lower than muscle. Um, the other three statements are true. Um, CT angiogram signs are not specific for adenocarcinoma. They can be seen in the setting of lymphoma. Um, lymphoma is um, a disorder um, that, uh, like with the airways, isn't always so aggressive that it may um, uh, Im impinge upon um, the structures that are opacified. Uh, the other true statement here is maybe seen in the setting of obstructive pneumonitis by central mass, um, if the blood vessel is still patent. Here's a frontal image. And we're going to show you a lateral image in just a few seconds. And here's the lateral chest x-ray. Okay, now returning to the frontal, please identify the sign on this frontal image. Now, in this uh, patient, um, both hyla are enlarged. And we can see that there is a bit of a bulge in the upper right mediastinum um, above the right tracheobronchial angle. Um, what we see here is what's called the one, two, three, or the pawnbroker sign. We see basically um, um, some enlargement, if you will, or almost mass-like enlargement in three locations: the uh, right, um, the right mediastinum, and both hyla. It's poster minus of the uh, pawnbroker's symbol, which is three balls. What's your best diagnosis with a pawnbroker or one, two, three sign? 
So the classic um, teaching is to think about sarcoidosis as the cause of these um, um, three sites of um, uh, fullness uh, when we see them, uh, representing uh, bilateral hilar and right mediastinal lymphadenopathy. That's relatively bulky. Identify this sign. On this image, we see a lucency in the upper abdomen that's um, really well delineating the diaphragm across midline. Uh, we refer to this as, as the continuous diaphragm sign. Uh, what's your diagnosis? So when we can see the diaphragm uh, and the lucency is below this diaphragm, and we see the diaphragm continuously across midline and the lucency looks like it's inferior to it, uh, we think about pneumoperitoneum. Now, in the more uncommon cases where we see the diaphragm really, really well across midline on a chest x-ray, but the lucency looks like it's above the diaphragm, we tend to think about things like pneumopericardium or perhaps pneumomediastinum. Um, some other examples of um, kind of these uh, continuous diaphragm signs you can see on this image, um, which is kind of really a window just to show you there's a kind of a lucent, smooth interface that corresponds to air beneath the diaphragm crossing midline. Um, Here's another example. Um, so some of them um, um, may quite require a little bit of windowing to see sometimes. Name three other radiographic signs in the pneumoperitoneum that you might see on portable chest x-ray. So besides a continuous diaphragm sign, um, sometimes uh, pneumoperitoneum on a portable chest x-ray may present as a regular sign, a falciform ligament sign, a ligament teary sign, um, or a football sign. Um, here's an example of a portable chest x-ray with a regular sign um, in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. In this case, we see the stomach um, and there's um, air um, on the other side of the um, stomach wall permitting us to see the wall of the stomach um, pretty well. This is a regular sign um, in a patient who has pneumoperitoneum on a portable chest x-ray. Uh, the falciform ligament sign corresponds to a situation where the falciform ligament um, in the anterior upper abdomen is being um, elucidated by air on both sides of it. Um, so sometimes we can see this, especially on portable chest x-rays that might go a little bit lower. This is another imaging feature of a uh, pneumoperitoneum. Um, this is a case where not only do we see a falciform ligament sign, but what's called a football sign. Um, there's so much um, um, free air within the peritoneal space that it's forming this large, lucent structure that occupies most of the abdomen. That should remind us of a football or a rugby ball, basically. Um, here's another example of a football sign, this one on, a, on, a, on an abdominal imaging um, uh, study. What sign helps identify the lobe in which the consolidation exists in this patient? And so the answer we're looking for here is the silhouette sign. Which lobe is this consolidation situated in? So we have a consolidation uh, within the uh, lower medial lower right lung, and it's uh, obscuring our ability to see the clean interface of the right cardiac silhouette. Um, the cardiac silhouette, the heart, lives in the anterior half of the chest, just like the middle lobe, the right middle lobe. Um, the heart doesn't live in the posterior half of the chest, where the right lower lobe would be. So um, because this consolidation seems to obscure the heart margin, we presume the consolidation's in the anterior half of the chest, and therefore in the right middle lobe. Identify this sign. So on this image, we see um, relatively geographic um, alternate regions where the, large, where the lung parenchyma looks a little bit blacker and then a little bit grayer. Um, this is a mosaic attenuation pattern. Now, uh, which of the three major causes of a mosaic pattern is most likely if the vessels in the lower and higher attenuation regions are the same size? Now this probably requires us to kind of just make sure we understand what the three major causes of a mosaic attenuation pattern are. Um, those three causes are heterogeneous air trapping, 
um, heterogeneous small vessels disease, like in, say, a chronic PE patient or a small vessel um, vasculitis patient, and um, a patient that has just uh, multifocal patchy ground glass lung opacities. Um, in cases where the mosaic attenuation pattern presents in such a way that the vessels look the same size in both the low and high attenuation regions, we tend to favor that third um, cause, where we have multifocal ground glass lung opacities present. Now, the most likely diffuse infiltrative process to result in mosaic attenuation is Mosaic attenuation patterns, um, all those three causes, um, by far, far and foremost, the um, um, air trapping is the most common uh, re, uh, cause of mosaic attenuation pattern. And of these five disorders, hypersensitivity to pneumonitis is the one that's most likely associated with air trapping. Now, of those three major causes of a mosaic attenuation pattern, which is the most likely if some regions do not follow lobular borders? Now, in cases of uh, mosaic attenuation where the issue is small airways or small vessel disease, um, the differences in attenuation tend to be relatively lobular in their kind of distribution um, or definition. Uh, in cases where the cause is multifocal ground glass pasties, sometimes those will not necessarily follow the lobular borders. Now, of those three major causes of mosaic attenuation, which is more likely if the higher attenuation regions have variable attenuation? And in cases where the cause is multifocal ground glass lung opacities, um, we may see cases where the higher attenuation regions have variable attenuation. Um, in cases where we're dealing with small vessels disease or small airways disease, those um, um, higher attenuation regions uh, represent um, normal lung parenchyma. Um, the pathologic uh, lung is the black or appearing lung, and normal lung parenchyma is relatively homogeneous in its um, appearance. Name this sign. So the left hemidiaphragm in this image is not a smooth um, dome, um, but rather has kind of a point or a steeple almost to it. We refer to this as a juxtaphrenic peak, which is false result, uh, regarding juxtaphrenic peaks. Okay, so juxtaphrenic peaks um, are, are related to the inferior accessory fissure. Um, generally, we see them uh, when there's been upper or middle lobe volume loss, and we sort of tug up on um, the lung basis, if you will. Um, and that volume loss can be due to atelectasis, fibrosis, or sometimes just resection of, the, of that upper lobe entirely. Um, and they tend to happen more often on the right than on the left side. So this one's a little bit uh, less common than most uh, juxtaphrenic peaks we're going to see. The false statement here is D, most often seen on supine rather than upright bradygraphs. So that, that, that kind of tugging is more accentuated when the patient's actually standing up. What sign is present here? And if we look at the uh, posterior right lower lobe on this patient, uh, we have an opacity and the blood vessels um, that are kind of heading towards that opacity have this um, shape or distribution where they're kind of um, um, converging, if you will, as you move from central to periphery. Uh, people refer to this as a comet tail sign. Uh, list three other features of round atelectasis. So um, as you probably inferred, uh, when we see a comet tail sign um, associated with an opacity of the lung, um, we tend to think of an entity called round atelectasis, which is a form of cicatricial atelectasis where there is um, 
fibrosis and, and retraction of the visceral pleura, usually due to some sort of um, exudative process that occurs centripetally. Um, other features that we would expect to see um, in this kind of diagnosis setting are a round oval mass that corresponds to that region of atelectatic lung parenchyma. That mass abuts the pleural surface because the actual cause of the cicatrical atelectasis is visceral pleural fibrosis that's occurring centripetally. Um, usually we might um, see signs of an exu exudative um, pleural process, um, pleural thickening, um, maybe a pleural effusion um, on that same side. And sometimes even the pleura might enhance. Um, because um, exudative pleural processes are probably more common in the posterior lower lungs than elsewhere, just because of gravity, um, round atelectasis and the comet tail, comet tail sign that comes of it um, is more common in posterior lower lobes.